joyful shout to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before him with thanks. Let's shout songs of joy to him. The Lord is a great God, the great King over all other gods. Let's give him the praise he's due this morning. Still what you say, saying, I have no reason to praise. I will give thanks. I will give thanks. When the roar that I hear is the voice of my fear, trying to silence this hope in my heart, I will give thanks. Jesus. We want to give you the praise that you deserve today, Lord Jesus. We want to put away our thoughts of other things and just focus on all you've done for us, Lord. We love you so much.
just one word You calm the storm that surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch can be seated. We'll continue with worship in just a little while at the end of our message during what we call our response time. 
But I'd just like to welcome you all this morning to Silver Creek Fellowship. This would be a great time during our service for you to fill out a connection card for us. Don't forget on the back side of this card, there's a place for your prayer requests and your answers to prayer. Every Tuesday morning, we have a prayer meeting where we gather together and we pray over each and every one of these cards. And I just believe it's worth your time to fill in your prayer requests because we get to celebrate over and over again as people's prayer requests move from the top into the bottom, into the answers to prayer. At the end of the service today, just stick these in the box that are there in the back or out in the entryway uh, where you came in. Those boxes are the same place if you came today prepared to give tithes or offerings. You can do that in those bins. You can also give in so many different ways here at Silver Creek. You can give online, you can give by text, you can give through the app, which is my favorite method, the Silver Creek Fellowship app. In, it is really a one-stop for information, for events, for sign-ups, a place where you have access to your uh, Bible. You can even take your sermon notes right into the app, so I would highly recommend that you check that out. I just have a, a one quick announcement that I'd like to make today before we jump into our message, and that is that next Saturday on the 10th is our Next Step Growth Track. Now, at Silver Creek Fellowship, we believe that all of us believers in God's family have a calling to continue growing in our walk and into the image of Jesus Christ, that we have this continual growth that's necessary for us and for the world. How do we accomplish that, though, corporately together? Well, we have what we call our next step growth track. And what this is, is in step one, you learn about how to belong to the Lord and how to belong to his family. And we talk about the history and the beliefs of this church. In step two, we talk about what are the habits of a healthy disciple and what does a disciple do? In step three, we talk about how God has uniquely shaped you for ministry. And in step four, we talk about how you can share your testimony and what God has done in your life with others uh, all around the local area and around the world. This is really an important thing. We put a lot into this. We believe that God wants to help you move along in your discipleship journey. The classes aren't, it's not like you graduate the class, you're like, oh, now I'm a healthy disciple. The classes are an introduction to the habits that will help you as you continue to grow into the image of Jesus Christ. So I just want to encourage you, uh, take some time, look through our next step offerings, get signed up for our next go around and continue on in your journey. Now, today I'm actually preaching a message that I did not write and I did not prepare. My dad, Rob, was supposed to be preaching today, and as if you're on the prayer chain, you heard uh, yesterday morning he had a stroke-like uh, event. We're not exactly sure whether or not it was a stroke at this point, but he is in the hospital in Salem. He had, couldn't bear weight on his left leg. Others, he didn't have any other symptoms this go around, so he's there, he's undergoing treatment, he has further testing needed today to confirm whether or not it was a stroke, but the good news this morning, he did uh, finally get a, a swallow test, and he got to use a graham cracker to do that swallow test, and he was very excited about that graham cracker and was able to order breakfast for the first time eating or drinking anything since uh, this all began yesterday morning. So we appreciate your prayers as a family. And as I came down yesterday with the realization that he wasn't preaching and I would be, I sat down, I started thinking, well, what would I want to talk about today? And I just immediately knew I need to share his message. I need to share the message that he's prepared because I am not going to allow sickness or health to get in the way with what God wants to communicate with us this morning. So I spent some time with this yesterday and again this morning, and I just really want us to hear um, what was on uh, Rob's heart uh, this week as he was thinking and praying about what needed to be shared today. Okay, so we're going to be primarily in 1 Samuel today. The story we're going to look at is in 1 Samuel chapter 14. But we have a little bit of ground to cover before we get there. And the first thing I want to look at is what actually Jesus says to us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Jesus says, For where two or three gather together as my followers or in my name, I am there among them. That's good news for us, right? Amen? Jesus says that whenever two or three people gather together in his name, he is there in their midst. Now, some of you might uh, want to say, well, does that mean he's not with us if we're alone? Well, of course not. We know that Jesus promised he would never leave us or forsake us. So he's with us, whether we're alone or gathered together with people. But scripture does say over and over again 
that there's a special experience and presence and power of God that's available to us believers when we gather together with other believers. There's something incredibly powerful about when we agree together in faith as believers living together in biblical community. But here's the problem. For so many people, they're missing out on that truth. They're missing out on what I believe are the most vital and important relationships in their life. In fact, I'd like you to write this down. This is the first spot in your notes today. It says, you'll never do all God wants you to do without the right people around you. I absolutely can promise you this. You will never accomplish all that God wants you to accomplish without the right people around you. And you may be tempted to say, Kurt or Rob, I've got God. Isn't that enough for me? But if you look throughout Scripture, you're going to see that God uses His people to bring about His purposes, and there is great power in the gathered family of God. If you look from the very beginning of the Bible all the way through to the end, you're going to see this is a constantly taught theme. And if you go to that very beginning in Genesis, uh, when God is speaking to Adam, he says, it's not good for man to be, fill in the blank with me, alone. He said, it's not good that the man be alone. So he created Eve. I want you to remember, this is before the fall. This is before sin entered the world. And even in that perfect world that God had made. Being alone was not a good thing. We needed each other from the very beginning. This is in God's design of us. Look at what Solomon says. Solomon's known as the wisest uh, human that ever lived. Ecclesiastes 4.9, he says, two are better than one. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. Deuteronomy 32.30, Moses' wisdom book. If one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. In other words, two is not twice as good as one. It is 10 times. It's a multiplier. It's much, much more than just one added. And you know what? The opposite is true as well. Not only can the right people propel you in the right direction, but the wrong people can also propel you in the wrong direction. Paul warned the church in Corinth of this reality. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. He said, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company, it's another way of saying the wrong people will corrupt good character. In fact, what I want you to do for a moment is a little exercise with me. I want you to think about the five most dominant voices in your life. The five people that you've allowed really to speak into the direction of your life. And actually, this can be applied to any different area of your life. If you show me the five voices speaking into your life, I will tell you what trajectory your life is on. Let's use an example. Let's say at work. The five voices that you are closest with at work, your work buddies. If they all hate their job, and are constantly complaining and grumbling about their work, and they hate their boss, guess what, friends? You are heading in the wrong direction because bad company corrupts good character, and you're going to be influenced by their attitudes. On the other hand, imagine this. The people surrounding you at work believe that as they serve people, that they're serving the Lord. And the people around you at work believe that as they commit themselves to a full day's work for a full day's pay, that God will strengthen them and help them. I absolutely guarantee you, your experience at work is going to be different. Let's use marriage, for example. If your five closest married friends are unhappy in their marriages or have messed up marriages, the guys are screwing around and chasing girls, the women are unhappy living in fantasy life, guess what? I can tell you your marriage is in trouble because the influence of those who are around you. On the other hand, if your five closest married friends love Jesus, if there's real godliness to their marriage, if the men know that they're to lay down their lives to serve their wives the same way Christ serves the church, if the wives have come alongside of their husband and say, God has called us to this marriage for a reason, for a purpose, guess what? I promise you, you're on your way to having a great marriages because the voices around you that you let access your life will speak life or death 
into your relationships or into your situation. Proverbs 18, 21. Again, a wisdom book from King Solomon. He said, the tongue has the power of life and death. Take your relationship with God. One more. If you are surrounded with only other casual Christians, they call themselves Christians, but they don't live like it or act like it. If you hang around people like that, they're going to pull you down. If church is not a priority in any of your sphere of life and friendship, guess what? It's likely not going to be a priority in your life. But if the flip side, if they're prayer people, who are there standing beside you and praying for you and supporting you and kicking you in the butt when you need kicked in the butt and they're speaking truth into your life, friends, the difference is immense. So why does this all matter? Because I honestly believe, and so did my dad, that God really wants us to be mindful about the people whom we are giving access to that deep, intimate part of our lives. Now, side note, am I saying don't make friends with non-believers? Have you heard anything that I've preached over the last couple of months, right? No, absolutely, we're not saying that. Make friends, absolutely do, but you've got to make sure you keep that balance in having believers and having authentic communities surrounding you because you need to be built up and you need to be fed and you need to be filled if you're going to be healthy. So what we're going to talk about today is the power of what he's, my dad called heart and soul relationships, heart and soul relationships. And I want to show you a story from the Old Testament that God really used over this last week in preparation for my dad and me as I got involved yesterday to really show me the importance of surrounding yourself with the right kind of people. The context of this story that we're going to look at is the Israelite army has been getting whooped by the Philistine army. Okay, now remember, the Israelites, good guys, Philistines, bad guys. But at this point in Israel's history, Israel is in a lot of trouble. King Saul has led them in a really bad direction. And now the Philistines have been, have been winning battle after battle. In fact, it's so bad that if you look at Samuel 14, the text says, actually the end of 13, says that... Only Jonathan and Saul even had swords, okay? They were the only ones that even had a weapon left because the Philistines had wiped out all the resources and all the production capability for the nation of Israel. They couldn't even fight back. Just Jonathan and Saul are left with anything other than like uh, farming tools to fight with. So things are really bleak. Saul has led them in a bad direction, but... As we look at our story today, what you're going to see is there's a moment that happens in Jonathan's life where Jonathan decides, I'm not going to live like this anymore. Things are not going well, and I'm not going to hide away and sit by and stand by any longer. It's time to move. So 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1 says, one day... Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man bearing his armor, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. It's interesting to me that he didn't tell his father, King Saul. Why? Well, to be honest, they had a very complicated and fractured relationship. If we were applying a 2020 logic to their relationship, we would say King Saul was an absentee father at best. He was an abusive father. He was a father that routinely acted out of anger and impulse. I mean, he tried to kill Jonathan's best friend a couple different times right in front of Jonathan. Okay, So this is a guy who'd swing and become wildly angry. And so Jonathan decided, I'm going to do what needs to be done. And he doesn't bring his father into the picture. One day for Jonathan, everything changed. He said, you know what? It might as well be today. I'm sick and tired of what's happening in my life, and I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to stay stuck in darkness in this cave any longer. For some of you here today, friends, maybe this is your day where you could say, I am sick and tired of where I'm stuck. I'm sick of living this lonely life. I'm sick of not having relationships or friends around me. I'm sick of not having any intimacy 
in my life, and I'm not going to stay stuck anymore. Because let's be honest, the right relationships rarely happen by accident, do they? They take time. They take investment. They take sacrifice. They take commitment. And today, I want to actually look at a few thoughts about what kind of people are the right people, okay? Because I don't want you just to take a dart and throw it at the board and say, well, I hope this one sticks. I want you to actually be able to look at this story today and see what kind of people are the right people to have this kind of relationship with. And so here's the first one in your notes there. It's the right people help us navigate obstacles and temptations. So the day had come for Jonathan where it was time to do something about this predicament that he and Israel were in. And Jonathan had had all he could take. So he tells his armor bearer, we're going to do something about this. And they start moving forward. But now let's look at verse 4. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. So there's a cliff on both sides. One was called Bozes and the other Sena. Now, if you're a note taker, you may want to circle the word Bozes and write right above it, slippery. Bozes means slippery. And Sena means thorny. Slippery on one side thorny on the other. And I think it's interesting that this is the names that is given to these places because in our journey towards God, we often have to navigate slippery slopes. Slippery slopes like temptation. And we often have thorny obstacles like uh, our spiritual enemy puts in place in our lives. Think about this. If you don't have the right people in your life as you're moving towards what God has promised you, it can be so easy for us to take the slippery slope and fall into temptation or for us to get stuck and tripped up on a road filled with obstacles. But when the right people are there, they can speak to us correction and direction and encouragement. Again, they can kick us in the pants when we need it. Is anyone else but me ever need a kick in their pants? I'm telling you, this is one of the things I need friends for the most. I don't often see my blind spots. I need other people who help me, who have been invited into my life to say, well, help me look out. The worst thing you can do, I was just actually in Depot Bay the other day, and this guy was backing in Depot Bay. You know how the parking spots, if you're out whale watching, are really narrow? This guy was backing his motorhome out, and he had a person standing there, but the person standing there apparently didn't know that this means stop and this means go, because they were just standing there watching as he clipped the car directly next to him because he backed out at too sharp of an angle. Just standing there, and then they're like, stop! And you're like, well, it's too late. You already tore the back off of that poor car. We need people who not only see the danger, but who are willing to say something about it. Friends, do you have people like this in your life? Do you have people that help you to see the obstacles, that help you to see the problems, that help to keep you from running into things that maybe you're just looking the other way? Maybe because of busyness or activity, you've taken your eyes off of the path and somebody else can come alongside you and say, hey, we're over here. Come back over here. Here's the next thing they'll help you with. They'll help you overcome a wavering faith. I don't know about you again, but sometimes my faith is really strong. And other times, it's not quite as strong. Anybody here say that faith is like that for you? Well, watch what Jonathan does here in real time, because I think this is encouraging for us to see. Jonathan says to his armor bearer, let's go across to the outpost of those pagans. Jonathan said to his armor bearer. In other words, we're going to go and we're going to attack. We're going to go and we're going to fight. And then look what he says next. Perhaps... The Lord will help us. That's encouraging, Jonathan. Thanks. Right? Perhaps the Lord will help us. In other words, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen, but perhaps. He goes on, he says, nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. See, what I see here is I see Jonathan is sure that God can provide the victory, but he's not sure that God will use him to do it. He's sure that God has the power, but perhaps the Lord will help us. You know, we see this all throughout the Bible. 
In another place, in Mark chapter 9, there's a story about a a man who um, brought his uh, demon-possessed son to Jesus. Let's look at that real quick. Mark 9, verse 20. So they brought the boy to Jesus, but when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, uh, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The Spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. See that what's happening in the Father is what happens in us often. It's like this spiritual boxing match that's taken place. He knows, he he believes, but at the same time, he struggles. And so he's saying, Jesus, help me with my unbelief. This is often what we do. You know, we'll be in a meeting and we'll feel an impression from the Lord or a direction from the Lord. And we'll say, you know, I believe God is leading us to go in this direction. And then we're like, I think, right? Uh, Most likely possibly. And we need the right people around us to say, no, you're right. I'm feeling that that's exactly what God is speaking. This is what scripture says. This is the evidence that that is the will of God. And they begin to work and build our faith together. If it just relies on my faith alone, friends, we're in trouble because there's times that our faith is wavering. I want you to write this down because this is the heart of this whole message. And I'm praying that this will land in your hearts the same way that it's landed in mine. Who are the right people? The right people are with you, heart and soul. Write this down. The right people are with you, heart and soul. The right spiritual influencers and influences are with you, heart and soul. I'm not talking about casual friendship here. I'm not talking about Facebook friends. I'm not talking about someone you follow on Twitter. We're talking about people that you live and spend your life with, heart and soul, every bit of it. In fact, this is what the armor bearer says, and I just love it. What Jonathan just said is like, hey, God can certainly win this battle, but I'm not sure if we can. Perhaps we can. Let's go. 1 Samuel 14, 7, the armor bearer says, do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. I am with you, heart and soul. I'm going to be there for you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not here for a while and then gone. You're not going to do something that's going to cause me to recoil or run away. I am with you from the deepest place in my life, from my heart and my soul. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm praying for a miracle, for a family member, for a friend, I don't want to pray alone. I want some heart and soul prayer warriors to link their arms with me. I want an army of believers to charge heaven's gates, knocking on the door, combining our faith together, believing together in unison. Remember, where two or three are gathered, so God is there. I want some people with me, helping me, supporting me, lifting me up, standing beside me, in front of me, behind me. Friends, we need heart and soul people. Let me ask you, when you go through a tragedy in life, I hate to say these lines. At some point, you will go through tragedy in your life. Do you know what you need in a moment of tragedy? You need heart and soul people. That day that your teenage daughter comes home pregnant, that day that a loved one is struggling in addiction, that day dealing with gender identity, and that day of dealing with the fallout of broken relationships in a spiritual family, that day where sin catches up to you and stuff begins to change. We need people who are not going to look at you and say, well, if you'd just been a better parent, maybe you could have avoided this pain in your life. Get behind me, Satan. We need people who will stand next to us and lock arms with us and stand there heart and soul, who say, we're going to pray this thing through. We're going to see whatever God will do in this situation, but we are going to walk through this thing with you. The worst thing, friends, I know so many times where this happens. 
someone struggling in their marriage. And instead of having heart and soul people to stand by them who say, I'm not going to take sides in this thing, but here's what I will do. I'm going to stand with you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray that God saves this marriage, that God restores this marriage. We are not going to give up on that. We're going to stand with you no matter what. Instead, they find friends who say, yeah, you're right, and yeah, you're right, and then separate. Friends, we need heart and soul people who will stand with us regardless of what we're facing. I love um, the relationship between Naomi and Ruth in the Bible. Ruth has one of the most beautiful heart and soul um, statements that I think you can find in Scripture. Ruth says to Naomi in Ruth 1, 16 through 17, wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you live, I'll live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And where you die, I'll die. And there I will be buried. I ask the Lord to punish me terribly if I don't keep this promise. Not even death will separate us. She's saying, I'm all in. A hundred percent, I'm giving myself to this relationship. It's a heart and soul relationship. Think of the story in the Old Testament when uh, the Israelites are fighting against the Amalekites. And the, down in the valley, Moses goes up onto the mountain. Remember the story, if Moses keeps his hands up above his head, the Israelite army is successful in fighting down below. But when he gets tired and his arms begin to fall, they begin to lose the battle. So two heart and soul friends, Aaron and Hur, come and stand on each side and hold Moses' arms up when he's too tired to do it for himself. Friends, who is standing by you that when you're too tired, when you're vulnerable, when you're weak, is willing to say, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere. I will stand by you no matter what. You know, if we look at the New Testament church, friends, what do we see? The New Testament church, as we see in the book of Acts, is a biblical community where people are sharing their lives together to the extreme that if one person had a need, they were selling their property to finance the needs of the people within the church. Their New Testament radical sharing of life was so different than what the world had seen that the rest of the world was taking notice and saying, why are you guys like this? This is different. We've not seen this before. We've not seen authentic community in this way. And the Bible says as a result, they were actually giving praise to their Father in heaven. It became evangelistic the way they shared their lives together. My dad has been a pastor for a long time. And you have probably heard him make this statement more than any other statement that he makes in being the leader of our church family for so many years. You need to be part of a small group fellowship. Heard that before? Here at Silver Creek Fellowship, it may sound like a broken record. And many of you might say, you know, I just don't have time for that. I get it. You talk about it all the time. But we live in reality, and we just don't have time. I mean, Saturdays and Sundays are our only day off. We work the other five days a week. And listen, I'm going to tell you something. So do the rest of us. You have time for what you make time for. What's important to you will be given time. It's a reality in life. I know you're busy. I know many of you are very, very busy. I'm telling you what, I'm very busy. And is small group always convenient? Nope. Do I always want to go? Nope. Are there small group weeks that I'm like, boy, we've been so busy this week, let's just sit this one out? Yep. Do I still believe it's important? Yes. Why? Because we need these kind of relationships in our life. You cannot do this Christian walk just showing up to this big meeting, seeing people, learning their names from their name tag, greeting each other as you have coffee, and then going about life as usual. You need people who know what's happening in your life. You need friends. You need people that on that day of tragedy show up at your house to help you, who bring you meals when things are going wrong, who are there praying for you, who you know, without a shadow of a doubt, dropped whatever they were doing in that moment 
and began to pray. Friends, we need authentic Christian community. And we believe that that happens in small groups. I'm not just talking about only simply small groups that meet in people's homes. We have small groups here where we do things like addiction and recovery. We have small groups that are Bible studies. We have small groups of lots of different kinds, but you need to be authentically connected with other believers. You're never going to have time for it. The devil is going to make sure of it because the last thing he wants for your life is this type of authentic community. When I look at our church today, this is my dad speaking, and I couldn't agree more. When I look at our church today, I see the biggest need that we are facing is the need for authentic, growing relationships within our community. See, most of us just feel we're too busy, but that's the wrong people being allowed to speak into our lives. We need the right people inspiring us with God's truth, growing alongside of us, praying for us, lifting us up. We need true and authentic relationships, friends, if we are possibly going to see the kind of biblical community that God wants to create here in Silverton through us. Band, you can come back up. I want to encourage you, as the school year starts, which by the way, (laughs) the school starts this week. What happened? School starts this week, um, and in these seasons of transitions, there's lots of things that are happening, and I want to encourage you in this season, over the next few months, the habits that you put in place right now are going to uh, have much higher chance of sticking with you throughout this school year, so you need to find a small group. My small group's going to start back up next week. If you're not in a small group, we meet right after the second service in the entryway. Everyone's invited. It's a great introduction to small group place where you can meet people, get to know other families, and then maybe you'll find a group that works for you, another relationship, and you might be able to launch off and do something else. If you're here and you're not part of a small group and you'd like to find out more, we need more small group leaders. We need more small group leaders. Why? We can't just put everyone that's here into existing groups. We constantly need new groups. So this year, our goal is to launch five new small groups to add to our already uh, amazing groups that we have here in our community. If that's you, then after the service today, Mark is going to be at the small group table. I'm available as well. You can talk with us. We're going to have training available for you. We'll have more information available for you. We're even going to have a great big day in October that we dedicate to small groups where you can come and find out and meet the small group leaders from different groups. We are going to go out of our way in this season to help you to develop these type of healthy relationships because I believe they matter. I believe we need them, and I believe it's essential to the next steps that we want to take as a church family in our community. Can I just tell you, the more we are involved in helping people and supporting our community and supporting the nations, the more we're involved in that, the more the enemy takes notice of what we're doing. And the more he takes notice of what we're doing, the more he starts to try to mess with people's lives. Why more do we need then? to gather together, to help each other, to support each other, to encourage each other, and to make sure that we're standing alongside each other and not allowing each other to go down the slippery slope or down the thorny path. Friends, I want to pray with you here today because I understand that this issue of relationships is a loaded one. I know some of you have been burnt really bad in the past. I know that you've been in church families And you have baggage and trauma, and we call it sheep bite. Sometimes they do bite. The sheep will occasionally bite each other. And the reality is, friends, that's not a good enough reason to not press forward to see what God might do in this season. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you today. Then we're going to sing a couple of worship songs. And while we're singing those worship songs, we have several responses available right up here in the front. We have communion that's available in the front and in the back where you can hold in your hand and be reminded that Jesus Christ paid a price for you. That it was by his body and his blood that was shed so that we could have a relationship with him. And that relationship should affect all of our other relationships on this earth. 
Friends, maybe you're here today and immediately as I'm speaking about this, you see this is an area of stronghold in my life. This is an area of real difficulty. I'm thinking of all the reasons why I can't do this right now. You need to come to the cross today and write that down and leave it here today at the cross. If you're praying for your one or you're praying for relationships that God would help you in this area, come light a candle that represents those prayers. We have prayer available in the back. We'll have prayer here in the front. We believe that it's time for us now to respond to God. So let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give us a heart and soul relationship. I pray, God, that you would move us right now. Just like Jonathan that day, that you would move us right now out of our caves, out of our isolation, out of our season of loneliness, God, and you would help us get up and start moving. God, I pray as we begin to move, we would see your power on display in our life. We would see your spirit, God, moving us and propelling us and comforting us forward. We would see, God, your desire for us to live in authentic community with authentic biblical relationships around us. For those that are here that have been wounded, God, I pray for healing. God, I pray right now that you just bring your healing power to their hearts and you would help us, God, to be able to receive the kind of friendship that you want to pour out in our life. Lord, we love our relationship with you. And I pray as Jesus prayed that we would be unified in the same way that you and your Father are. I pray that you would help us build authentic relationships and you'd help us be committed to seeking them and desiring them. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's stand together. Let's continue in our worship now. Let's seek the Lord. Let's let him now speak into our hearts. Let's respond to whatever he wants to say. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. Set a fire down in my soul.
thank you, Jesus, that all we have to ask, all we have to do is ask for, and you are more than willing to send your spirit to us. don't just go don't if God's speaking to you about this then take a step send a text to somebody reach out to somebody 
Give somebody a call today after church. Rekindle a relationship that God is leading you to. Set, go to the small group desk and get yourself on the list. Come next week after church to our small group here and see, hey, is small group something that I could find my way in? I'm going to tell you next week I'm starting a new sermon series where we're going to go through the, the most of the fall where we're actually going to talk about what we believe. We're going to go through the Apostles' Creed line by line, and we're going to learn about the basic beliefs of our Christian faith. It would be a great time for you to be in a small group. The discussions will be great. It'll be an opportunity for us to really grow in what we believe and in our understanding. So I would encourage you, take action today. Don't just go, but go and do what the Lord is leading you to do. God, thank you for this day. Thank you that you are for us and not against us. Thank you that you are with us. Thank you that your desire is to prosper us and give us a hope and a future. Thank you that our relationships matter to you. And thank you, God, that you're leading us and knitting us together. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. 